you. So I'd like to start by saying a huge welcome to the faculty. This is a momentous day. Uh, we're very sad to be saying goodbye to David, but we're very delighted that he's chosen to, to do a lecture as his son song at the faculty, although I suspect yes, you'll be Lecture around. Yes, might be putting it a bit Do you high, think? actually. Oh, okay. Uh, David doesn't really need any introduction. He's a, an amazing early childhood specialist, and I think probably one of the uh, most ardent supporters of childhood in the UK. He's a huge advocate for children, and um, his work speaks for itself. He's also internationally renowned, as we know, because he's always jet-setting around the world, doing lots of interesting things. Um, and the faculty is particularly grateful to David because, of course, he uh, is leaving uh, a fantastic legacy, uh, courtesy of the Lego Foundation, in the form of PEDAL, our research centre on play. Um, and we really are grateful for everything he's done. And without further ado, over to you, David. Great. Well, I've... <laughs> Thank you. It's always nice to get applause before you say anything. <laughs> Uh, so I hope you'll be uh, still quite pleased. Um, okay, so my life as a teacher, or I could have been a rock star. Did I make the right decision? I don't know. <laughs> um, huge thank you to everybody. Some of you have actually, some, some of you have come quite long distances. Uh, and um, I can remember who most of you are. <laughs> so, so that's good. Um, it's a huge honor and pleasure to, 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 to welcome you. Um, I was sort of wondering when I was told, you know, how many people wanted to come, whether, you know, are they celebrating what I've achieved or are they just pleased to see the back of me? <laughs> but anyway, um, now as you will know if you've seen me talk before, you'll know that usually I give extremely rigorous scientific presentations with the odd joke here and there. Um, but in the spirit of uh, this afternoon's event, basically I've cut out the um, rigorous scientific but, <laughs> so it's just a series of jokes. Um, in the words of uh, another famous Cambridge alumni, Peter Cook, there's a complete lack of rigour in, uh, <laughs> in, my, in my presentation this afternoon. So I'm going to go through uh, a little bit of uh, you know, what I've been up to over the last 40 odd years. Actually, we're going to start earlier than that. And, um, I'd, but I do want to make uh, one or two uh, points towards the end, and there'll be a demonstration of a particularly significant uh, piece of um, uh, observational study that involved some members of my family uh, many years ago towards the end, so that should be good fun. Now, does this... Ha -ha, da -da. So, these are the topics we're going to cover in the next 45 minutes. Uh, I think I can remember what most of them are about. So we're starting off with a bit of background about me, uh, my early influences, uh, the decline of education as we know it over the course of the last 30, 40 years, um, and then my time in Cambridge, what I've been up to uh, here, there and everywhere, and then some points I want to make at the end about what we now know about children that we didn't know when I started out. Um, and I would like to announce especially this is the first time, this is the world premiere, you're very honoured to be here, my new theory of play. Okay. Uh, everybody's been debating for probably the last hundred years what is play, and I finally worked it out, so you'll be very pleased to, <laughs> to, uh, to hear about that. Okay, it turns out to be quite an interesting mathematical uh, 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 solution to the problem. Okay. So, the formative years. There are three themes in this section. Uh, born free, growing up in the 1960s, and viva la revolution. <laughs> so um, I was born free because I was born two weeks after the start of the National Health Service. I should have been born, and typ typically for me, I was late. I should have been born <laughs> uh, just before the start of the National Health Service, in which case it would have cost my parents I don't remember what the sum was, but the equivalent of about a week's wages, I think, at the time, to have me taken to hospital and taken my, you know, my mother take to hospital and have the birth. But because I was two weeks late, and for the only time ever in my life, I was, I was uh, too big. <laughs> I was 10 pounds something when I was born, so a fortnight late, and, uh, and as a consequence, 
was born free, um, born in the same year as <coughs> Prince Charles, 1948, which apparently, according to one survey I saw a few years ago, turns out to have been the best year in the whole of the last um, century to have been born. And I think that's the start of what I'm going to describe as a, a very lucky and charmed life. Almost everything I've done, I haven't planned to do. It's all been a series of happy accidents, one way or another, including meeting my wife and having two of the loveliest daughters you could imagine. <laughs> and soon, a lovely grandson, which is great, as you'll see when Elizabeth stands up later on. <laughs> so, um, so I grew up in the 1960s when, of course, we all knew we all went to university. I was the first person to go to university in my family, as a lot of other people of my generation were. About 5% of people in the population of the age group got to go to university in those days, so very different times, and um, very revolutionary times. We were really going to change, change the world. So you make your own judgment as to how that worked out. <laughs> A bit frightening seeing me that big, isn't it? <laughs> so I must, I'm not ab absolutely sure, but I must have been five probably when this photo was taken. Of course, in those days we didn't have, you know, it wasn't so common to take, you know, selfies and photos every, every two minutes. So this is one of the rare early images <laughs> of, of myself. Uh, and then a little bit later on, <laughs> So, yeah, I had hair. So, <laughs> so here I am uh, during the university years <laughs> uh, when I was actually a member of, um, by this time I'd been a member of three rock bands as the most important bit, of course, of a rock band, which is the drummer. Uh, and that actually turned out to be one of the lucky things in my, in my life, as you'll see. And here's the next bit of good luck. <laughs> There's a story that's often told about how uh, Linda had two uh, friends, um, and I was trying to, uh, you know, the, at the sort of uh, student hop round about that time, I was very attracted to one of her friends. But one of her, this one of her friends wasn't very attracted to me, so she palmed me off with Linda, and... Uh, <laughs> and the rest is history. We now still know the individual concerned, and I think I made the right choice. <laughs> or, or at any way, they made the right choice. And you'll be particularly admiring my 1970s Cuban heels uh, and flared uh, loomed trousers. It was, actually a, it was actually a brown velvet suit, so you don't get those these days, do you? Okay. First job. This, I think this is about the only photograph in, in, in which I'm the one who had to bend over so as not to obscure other people. <laughs> that was my first uh, job as a, as a reception year one and year two teacher. We had, um, this was in Leicestershire, a very progressive county, as many of you will know, and we had what were called vertically grouped infants, uh, which wasn't a description of how you organize a classroom, but it was a... <laughs> It was a description of the fact that you had the first three years of schooling all in the one class. And I have to say, I've been a lifelong advocate of that ever since. And there's some nice research evidence to show that mixing children of different ages uh, is very beneficial, so in all sorts of ways. Um, so that, was, that really got me off to a good start. And uh, there were some very strange and, and amusing people on the, on the staff, as you can probably tell. It really got me. And, and we lived in very sexist times then in my first job. So if anything electrical went wrong, I was supposed to fix it. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Ah, yeah, so the next lucky thing was that Linda and I fancied it before we settled down and started a family. Um, oh, no, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. Yeah, so this is my first class. Actually, it's not all of them. There are some of them. And you know how it is with your first class, you can still remember um, some of them. See the little boy in the blue shorts at the top with the red pattern jumper on? Uh, I can't remember his surname, but he was called Ian. He was Scottish. 
And he was, this is about the only time he was ever still for that long. And so when I was hearing him read, I pretty quickly discovered that I had to be the one holding the book because he would do this all the time he was reading. <laughs> He's also a, I was also the child who taught me something very important about relationships with parents because his mother walked in on the first morning and said, Ian can read. And I thought, and I said, oh, that's great. And, I, and then later on I said to, to Ian, I said, he, Ian told me he could read. I said, would you like to bring one of the books he was reading um, in? And so he did and announced after a couple of minutes of reading the first couple of pages that actually he could read it really well because he could read it with his eyes shut. <laughs> <laughs> which he then proceeded to do. So he'd memorized the entire book. And when I said to, pointed to any word and said, so what does that say? Of course, he hadn't got the first idea. Anyway, so don't always believe everything parents tell you. Um, ah, right. OK. So this is what I was going to tell you about next. So Linda and I decided we wanted to have a, an interesting few years in a different part of the world before we settled down to start a family. And so we, I got a job through the British Council um, one of the head teachers of one of the schools had been told by her staff of about 30 uh, women that on no account should she come back without having recruited a young man. So I was very lucky to be the, in the right place at the right time. And we finished up having two and a half glorious years in Tehran. We were there when the Shah was um, deposed, um, which kind of messed our arrangements up a little bit. But nevertheless, we had two and a half years we were very annoyed with, um, uh, what was he called, Khomeini? The Ayatollah Khomeini, because Linda and I were right in the middle of practicing, rehearsing a fantastic production of the Gilbert and Sullivan, Mercado. And we got all the costumes, we rehearsed, rehearsed, and then we all had to leave the country and never actually did it. But anyway, this is me with some of my class in Tehran, also of mixed infants. Uh, and um, one of our earlier ancestors. So, early influences. Um, I, this kind of sums up my, my I, I always regarded myself as a bit of a Renaissance man. <laughs> uh, as in being fairly average at everything. Um, but one of the important things I, uh, have learned, I think, for, and I think is exemplified in the personage of Leonardo da Vinci is that separating art and science is a fairly meaning. The world is full of these false dichotomies, isn't it? And um, uh, I've quite often met people who say that, you know, to study young children uh, scientifically is somehow to lose something about you know, them as a whole person and so on and so forth. And I couldn't disagree more, really, because I think if you study something as complex as a young child, that actually, once you start to realize you know, how amazing they are, that actually you see them as a more beautiful thing than you, than you might just have seen if you just thought they were cute. So um, thank you, Leonardo, for that. Um, my other, the guy I really, really, really admire, though, is Charles Darwin. Um, I'd love to be able to go back in time and shake him by the hand and <laughs> thank him for what he achieved. Um, and really started off for me uh, a lifelong fascination with evolution, and particularly the evolution of the brain, as I'll show you in a moment. Uh, and I think probably Charles Darwin also exemplified the, the value of careful observation, which is something I've tried to do in my work. And, of course, it was the 1960s. So, so my other great ins inspiration, as, as in Vive la Revolution, was Shea, Shea Guevara. Some of you are probably too young to remember how big a phenomenon he was. He was a big pal of Fido Castro's and was killed in a, the Bolivian jungle where, in where he was trying to inspire revolution in Bolivia at the time. And for some reason, Everybody of my generation had a poster of this guy on their, on their wall. And I think when Linda first met me, Linda comes from a, her, her father was a headmaster, and she came from quite a, with a small C, I would say, conservative middle-class family. 
and uh, and um, had that appearance, if I can say that at the time. And um, when she first uh, 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 came into my into my student room, she saw a picture of this guy and another picture of somebody else, and underneath it said, smash capitalism. <laughs> so, the, so um, uh, but she soon discovered that, you know, un under every revolutionary, there's a sort of nice middle-class gentleman trying to get out, you know. <laughs> My other great influence, of course, some other Cambridge alumni, Pink Floyd, clearly the best band in the world by a mile. <laughs> Um, I was going to play you some Pink Floyd, but sadly there isn't time. But any time you'd like to hear some, do come round to our place and I'll happily, happily amuse you for hours. Did you see the Pink Floyd exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum recently? Anybody go to that? It was amazing. Anyway, there we go. So, uh, right, the evolution of the brain. I got a calendar given to me once, and this is one of the earliest uh, skulls we had at the time of... Homo sapiens, and um, uh, amused me to put there that he's still writing up his PhD. Some, for some of us, it takes longer than others. It took me 10 years, so not, not quite that long. OK, so the other thing that was happening in the 1960s was there was huge controversy and lots of really fundamentally inspiring things being written, I thought, about the future of education. And we were really debating education in you know, very serious terms. And um, to people were talking about the end of schooling, about the whole new way of educating children and so forth. And there were some really amazing uh, writers and books coming out. Some of you might be familiar with either of these. Paolo Freire, for example, was talking about education uh, as a way of liberating the oppressed um, uh, Marx would have called the, the proletariat, I suppose, but you know, the oppressed majority in the country and how education would lift them out of poverty and so on and so forth. And I think that's an ideal many of us still hold to, but um, it's not gone, perhaps happened as quickly as uh, he would have hoped, but he's still very much read. Ah, right, okay, we're there. So, and these were another couple, school is dead. This was my all time favorite though, teaching as a subversive activity. <laughs> I don't see any point in doing any teaching at all if it's not a subversive activity. I think that's precisely what education is about, isn't it? It should be about getting people thinking, getting people critiquing the present thing. I'm not sure these days it's quite politically correct to put a bomb on the front of the thing, but um, never, nevertheless. Neil Postman's book starts off really well. The first, the first um, chapter heading is crap detection. <laughs> and about all the useless knowledge that we fill children's heads with, you know. Um, there was, a, there was a, a, a brilliant educator in the 1960s, an American man called John Holt, and I've probably told you many of, many of you this before, who talked about children who are successes in the education and children who are failures. And he said, children who are failures forget everything you've taught them before the exam. And children who are successes forget everything you taught them after the exam. <laughs> and I mean, you know, I've got 13 O-levels, right? Could I pass any of them now? Almost certainly not, you know. All that stuff that we fill children's heads with. And he was really making the point that, you know, we live in, and it's become, of course, even more and more true that we live in a world of information overload. We don't need, children don't need to know stuff. They need to know how to find out about it and understand the underlying principles. So anyway, this is what was going on in the 1960s, and this is what we've got now. <laughs> Some of you will remember this book. It's an entirely empty volume. There are several chapter headings, but absolutely nothing written in any of it, <laughs> which just about sums up what's been going on. And then, and so to Cambridge. Now, another lucky thing, it turned out that the staff band at Homerton College needed a drummer. <laughs> and I turned up with some, you know, a few qualifications and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. But um, at least 30% of the discussion in one of my interviews, at any rate, was about my um, endeavors um, and my uh, 
on the musical side of things. So I have a sneaky suspicion that, in fact, the whole thing's been a big mistake and I should never have been here. Uh, and I, I got the job because I could, I could play the drums. And you'll see uh, people like um, Phil, what was his name, who was on the art department? Phil Rundle, yes, and the music lady, and Jane Eddon, and David Bridges, who was deputy principal of Homerton College and has been back in the faculty recently in, in their youth. And there I am, crashing away at the back. And I spent the first 17 years of my time in, uh, in the college and then in the faculty being involved in the early years and primary PG uh, course, and I had the very great pleasure of setting up the first early years. When, when I first arrived, it was just primary, and in 1990, I set up the first early years course, which is still running today. And um, uh, it was uh, a, a source of great pride to me that actually we got tended to attract the most highly qualified. We had several people who were qualified doctors. We had a qualified archaeologist. We had several people with PhDs who wanted to teach young children. And I was very proud and pleased to be able to attract people of that quality because that's really what we need. Because as you all know, early childhood education is when the real work is done. If you get that right, the rest of it um, is a doddle. <laughs> so, and here I thought I'd just show you some of my lovely PhD students, some of whom are here tonight, I should say, and see if you can spot the ones who are, who are present. So, uh, I think there's a couple of people in this picture who are here. I think you should be able to see Kate. Uh, and you don't look a day older, Kate. <laughs> and Maria. Um, and uh, lots of them. I, I think I broke the faculty record. I had 14 PhD students at one stage. Nearly broke me as well, but anyway, there we go. Uh, and we could quite often be found in the orchard, um, <laughs> which is a lovely place to go and celebrate somebody who's just passed their PhD or whatever. And there was one very amusing occasion when my daughters have always believed that my job basically consists of sitting around drinking tea, and, um, which is not far from the truth. And uh, there was one famous occasion when Elizabeth uh, was, was up in Cambridge and she decided she would take her friend to the orchard and she found myself and Dimitra, who some of you might remember, uh, in the orchard having tea. I was celebrating her having passed her PhD without corrections. So, uh, <laughs> so um, great times. Um, and my, my latest group, lovingly referred to as the dregs. <laughs> so, the, you know, they're the bit you scrape out at the bottom, you know, when you've drunk everything. Um, up to the male ratio quite a bit, actually. So I think we've got Pablo here today, and uh, I think we're going to hear from Dave and Matt later. Very musical and very talented uh, group. And Mahini there at the front, one of the many PhD students in my group who seem to um, uh, be very good at providing new subjects for our studies during the course of their PhD, which was lovely. So, now, of course, how are we doing? Are we doing all right? Um, so, uh, I arrived at um, Cambridge having taught for 12 years and being halfway through a PhD and having done a master's and so on, but um, very much within the psychology frame. And what I discovered was, when I entered the Faculty of Education, ultimately, was that there are all sorts of other... <coughs> ways you can do research and that one has to con consider one's ontological position and this sort of thing, which I'd never been told about all the time <laughs> up to that point, so I learned a lot. Um, but um, the other thing to say is, is that people, you know, it's the usual thing about teachers and about university lecturers, they say, oh, well, you've got these very short terms, got lots of holiday, you know, what are you doing, you know, but actually, as all of us know, um, it's one of those jobs, whether you're teaching young children, whether you're teaching at university, where it's with you every day and every night of your being, you're thinking about it. And sometimes 
Linda will say to me when I'm sitting about, you know, apparently doing nothing, <laughs> which happens now and again, uh, she says, what are you doing? And I say, oh, I'm sitting here having... Or, 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 usually it's when Linda's told me something and I haven't listened. And, uh, and um, she says, are you listening to me? And I'm saying, oh, sorry, what, you know. And, uh, and uh, I often say, to her, well, look, I can't, you know, I can't listen to everything you say. I'm sitting here having great thoughts, you know, so. <laughs> um, and, of course, the other feature is, is having, to, having to publish uh, or be damned. So here's some examples of me having great thoughts <laughs> when apparently you might think that I'm just on holiday or enjoying myself or whatever, you know. So where's everybody else there is, that's what they're doing. Obviously, I'm sitting there considering my epistemological uh, position. <laughs> um, and this was uh, <laughs> a, trip, a trip to New York. Um, when we went to New York, the main thing children want, the children wanted to do, I think you were about... You look older, but I'm pretty sure you were about 12 or 14, something like that at the time. I can't remember. But uh, their main thing they wanted to do was go into Macy's and come out with a brown bag. <laughs> and we went into Macy's, and you could get a very sort of, you know, um, insignificant sort of um, party frock for about $80. Or so. <laughs> so, so we didn't actually buy anything, but uh, the girls have always been very good at... Um, They've got very good social skills, so they managed to persuade one of the assistants to give them a brown bag each without buying anything. So, <laughs> so uh, honour was settled. That was all good. Uh, <laughs> I've never been a big fan of French philosophy. <laughs> um, uh, this is on in Hong Kong, I think. It's very nice. Um, Linda and myself looking slightly younger. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've mostly done this to make myself laugh. <laughs> uh, this actually, the, the others are all true. We were definitely, we were certainly there. Whether I was actually discussing, you know, Foucault or whatever, I don't know. But this is actually a postcard somebody sent me once, and I was very entertained by the sort of, you know, freedom and liberation of the lifestyle in the Cook Islands. Um, uh, but I didn't actually give a talk, even with PowerPoint. But I did go to Texas recently, didn't we, uh, Kira? Where's Kira? Yeah, and this was very... It, we were just sitting around the campfire most of the time, weren't we? <laughs> so. Anyway, so there is some serious work to do, and I discovered one way to make friends is to, is to edit a book. And so the... My, one of the books I'm still, I think, this one and one other I'm very proud of. This book has, has gone into four editions. It's sold thousands of copies. And it's very largely thanks to the brilliantly talented staff that at the time we had, and I'm, I'm sure still do have, on our primary PGC course. Almost everybody on the course contributed to this book. And it was... Um, and it really arose because when we were setting up the early years uh, PGC course, we really couldn't find a book that did the job. You know, there's very few people who have got the level of um, experience that you need to have to be able to give good advice, but also have got a, the depth of knowledge of, you know, the theory and the research and so on. And we had staff on the course who could do that. And you'll see Penny Coltman in the front there and Trish Maud, who is still around, I think, somewhere, Trish. Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, and lots of other, Leslie Hendy and all sorts of other people, some of you may remember. And I think this first came out in 1996, something like that, and it's been through four editions since. And, uh, <laughs> and now you can read my, my words of wisdom in the other book I'm very proud of, which is Developmental Psychology of Childhood Education, and they've just asked me to do a second edition of that. And you can read it in Chinese or in Korean, <laughs> should be, you be so inclined. I've put now I'm notorious in several languages, because one of the delights of having PhD students from overseas 
is that is that they're you know r remarkably clever people, but English isn't their first language. And there's this phenomenon which many of you might be familiar with, which is called false friends. So it's where there's a word in your own language, which is very similar to a word in the language you're trying to write in. Um, and what this and one of my students who actually um, is one of my great heroes, but I won't name her because she, <laughs> because she hate, hated to make mistakes. But uh, she once wrote that uh, Professor Smith's contribution to this field of research is notorious. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, what she meant to write was, was, was no notable or something like that, you know. But apparently in Spanish, notorio, some, some Spanish speakers here, um, Notorio means, you know, it's a, it's a great achievement. And of course, when I explained to Deborah that notorious is usually <laughs> used as a slightly negative connotation in English, um, she was uh, suitably mortified and changed it immediately. So this is the serious bit of the talk. How are we doing? It's only ten past five. I'm going to run. I'm going to be up, you know, up to speed for the first time in my life. Um, if there's anything that I feel that I've tried to contribute during uh, my career, it's to get people to take children seriously and to recognize how amazing they are and how they can do things that a lot of the books say, say, they, say they can't. And I think Jean Piaget um, has to take the credit for really establishing the study of young children and their, particularly their cognitive development in his case, as an area of serious scientific investigation. Um, apparently, he was a dreadful person to work for, but, it, but anyway, his contribution, his contribution is, was obviously enormous. I was once at a lecture um, by a man called Robert Siegler, who some of you might be familiar with, um, a Canadian developmental psychologist, and one of, my, one of my big heroes. And he described Piaget's contribution like this, because a lot of work in developmental psychology subsequent to this has in many ways shown how wrong Piaget was about a lot of things. Um, but uh, he did provide, Siegler said, an extremely detailed and accurate description of how children develop. Um, but his explanatory uh, theory turned out to be um, you know, completely uh, misguided. And in fact, Piaget himself critiqued some of it, he was one of these people who worked, you know, every day of his life, published his first book at the age of 14, his first scientific paper at the age of 14, and was still working when he died in his 80s. Um, but he said a lot of really important things, and I think every time an adult teaches something to a child, they prevent the child discovering it for themselves, is a rather extreme position. Um, but I think if you if you substituted the word teacher for minister of education in that sentence, then I think it starts to, starts to resonate with, uh, with some of us. Um, and here's a couple of other guys who have really made, I think, what now turns out to be a, perhaps a more lasting and significant impact. Um, Lev Vygotsky, the Russian, of course, who was born in the same year as Piaget but sadly died young, who has inspired so much of developmental psychology um, in the last um, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, and, and really raised the importance of looking at the social interaction that young children uh, are engaged in by adults and how they, and how influential that, that is. Um, and, you know, so now we've got a huge group in the faculty looking at dialogic teaching, for example. All of that comes from Vygotsky's early work. And, and my real hero, Jerome Bruner, I was very pleased to be invited by Professor Cathy Silver to Jerome Bruner's, the celebration of Jerome Bruner's life um, uh, a couple of years ago at Oxford. And um, has a huge following, it's had a huge impact on the study of early language, the study, and particularly wrote much more actually than Piaget and Vygotsky did about education in particular. Um, and his notion that any subject can be taught to a child at any age, at any stage of development, if you present it correctly, 
um, is a very inspiring idea, I think. And he demonstrated this beautifully, actually, by demonstrating that you could teach um, simultaneous quadratic equations to seven-year-olds if you did it as representing increasing the size of a square. I won't, <laughs> won't bore you with the details, but uh, really impressive work. Now, this is where um, I would like to illustrate uh, an event that's happened in our household when Elizabeth disproved Piaget and demonstrated to me very personally about the importance of taking children seriously and listening to them and observing them uh, because they often surprise you. Um, we, found, we discovered very early on when we had children and we, you know, did the usual thing of, you know, getting lots of books about how to bring up your child and so on and how children develop. And as, as you will all have discovered, if you've had your own children, the one person who hasn't read the book is the child. <laughs> and they don't stick to it. Uh, and very often, you know, so sometimes they do things they shouldn't be doing yet, sometimes they do. But on the whole, they are underestimated, in my view, if you know how to look. So we're just going to demonstrate now a particular um, event that occurred in our house that um, demonstrated some of this. Now, now um, one of Piaget's uh, famous contributions, of course, which many people, some people still write about, is his four stages of development. And the children start off in the sensory motor stage, and they go through the stage of that stage, concrete operations on, and then they go into the stage of formal operations. And I think it's now generally recognized that he underestimated children and he overestimated adults. Because <laughs> many adults don't ever reach the, his stage of formal operations. Um, but children weren't supposed, and, and young children, in his view, start off as being very egocentric. And famously, he talks about the fact that a young child can only see the world from their points of view. They can't see the world from others' points of view. And these days, there's a lot of work about young children developing what's called a theory of mind, which means that they understand that other human beings have a mind in the way they do, and that you can know something they don't know, and vice versa and so on. And, but you're not supposed to have really finally achieve this until you're about five or six years of age. And Elizabeth, when she was, we now think, about three, uh, we can't quite find the records precisely, but when she was about three, demonstrated that she had a theory of mind and a very sophisticated one, and she certainly was able to see things from other points of view. Now, this particular illustration involves <coughs> Elizabeth, age three, this is Nurse Elizabeth, obviously, uh, <laughs> at the time. Uh, me, a bottle of milk, and a bottle of ketchup. Uh, now this tells you a lot about our household. So we're sitting at the tea table, and I'm at one end and Elizabeth at the other end. Um, it's a bit complicated to, to, um, to describe. So we thought we'd do a little demonstration. So for this demonstration, I'm going to need Elizabeth. <laughs> so if you can stand, you can stand there. You can turn sideways. No, the other, that's right, like that. Right. So Elizabeth's sitting at one end of the table, and I'm sitting at the other. And then in between, we've got a milk bottle and a bottle of ketchup. So I think I have two volunteers. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah and Ben. So who'd like to be the milk bottle? Right, so there you are. So I'd like to put these over your head, please. <laughs> Just so that we can, we can remember who's who. Maybe they should stand where they're supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, Sarah. So you come and stand over here, like that. Okay. And then... Is it? Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ben's here. <laughs> So we've got Elizabeth, ketchup, milk, daddy, okay? And it goes like this. What are you doing, Elizabeth? Oh, that looks fun. Oh, beep, boo, ketchup, beep, boo, ketchup. Very good, Yay! well done. <laughs> I think you ought to stand there with the things on. No, you can take them off now. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Beautifully. Uh, you can see I did warn them about this early so they could get into the part. I thought they really <laughs> captured the essence of... Uh... Right. So as you can see, what Elizabeth's quite, you know, and so you often you get these, um, you know, completely accidental uh, um, demonstrations if you, you know, if you spend time with young children. And often it's said that you can see in children's play, you can see them doing things that, you, that they won't show you if you, if, you know, if you set up an experiment or if you, you know, try and provoke it, they won't do it. But if you just watch them long enough, eventually you'll see. And there was Elizabeth, about two years before she's supposed to uh, be able to do it, showing very clearly that she could see the world from somebody else's point of view. So well done, Elizabeth. And uh, it's stood you in good stead ever since, I think. <laughs> and and uh, I'm not the only person who's realized that young children are amazing. And there have been a number of books come out over the last few years um, Alison Gopnik has certainly contributed enormously to our understanding of uh, what's going on in the mind of an infant. Uh, and she wrote another one following up a, a statement of Piaget about you know, children being little scientists. She wrote a, a book called The Scientist in the Crib, and she wrote this wonderful book called The Philosophical Baby. And if you want something that's really entertaining and uplifting to read, I would recommend either of those books because they're just, uh, just wonderful. Um, and Tiffany Field also wrote um, a lovely book about the amazing infant, uh, not from quite such a, um, a, a scientifically rigorous point of view, but, but full of wonderful illustrations of her observations, for example, of her own um, children and the sorts of things they did. And um, this is just one example of that. Can you, can you read that at all? Um, this is just a list of what her uh, little girl um, called Tori uh, could do when she was one year old, when she was 12 months. And there's some lovely ones. Um, so it says she's learning to play the xylophone. <laughs> you can imagine what that, what that um, amounted to. Um, she... Um, Oh, this is one especially for charity. Where's charity? <laughs> she um, loved squeezing Lisa's guinea pig and making it squeak. <laughs> you tried that? <laughs> um, all sorts of things. Now, books are now her favorite toys. Uh, brushes own, her own hair when you ask her to. Likes phone calls if there's nobody on the other end. Uh, tries to blow her nose with a handkerchief, um, picks up the phone and jabbers into it, um, fairly assertive about hugging, often approaches people with arms open as if to greet them with a big endearing hug. Um, we were actually reading, in, in, in our endeavor to try and find out exactly what age Elizabeth was when she was able to play the game with the milk bottle and the ketchup, we were looking at some of the diaries and um, Elizabeth's vegan, and uh, I thought she won't mind revealing this, very proud vegan, and actually at the age of two years, something or other, it was, that, it was just at that stage where she stopped talking telegraphic speech and started talking full sentences, and Linda had written down in her diary about the girls some of the sentences that they came out with, and one of the sentences that Elizabeth came out with at the age of about three, again, two years, 11 months, something like that, Mummy, this meat isn't very interesting. <laughs> so it's a sign of things to come. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this is uh, just something from Alison Gopnik's book. I'll let you, I'll let you read, it, read it through. But basically, her, the thesis of her book is that... Um, a, th a three-year-old's wild make-believe explains how we can imagine the future, write novels, and invent new technologies. I mean, I've written in some of my work that play, you know, play is not is not is so far from being trivial. It's actually probably one of the, you know, hugest um, 
achievements of, of as, as, a, as a species. You know, all mammals play, but you look at mammalian play in mice and rats and chimpanzees and all the rest of it, and even in chimpanzees, it's relatively straightforward, it's very relatively simple, limited to a few um, types of behaviours. In human children, it's a vast array of things. Almost every, well, every aspect of development you can think of, there's a sort of play that's, that's, that's there and that seems to be put. And Alison, uh, you know, has written so powerfully about that as well. So when I started out doing serious research on young children, uh, I did my PhD about metacognition in young children, or what's now referred to often as self-regulation. And the first big research project I ever did was called the Cambridge Independent Learning Project. It was financed by the Cam uh, Cambridge County Council. Um, again, just being very lucky, I was there in the right place at the right time. They were being given loads and loads of money to spend on early childhood education, and they just didn't have the time to spend it all and hire people in time to get it. All had to be spent by March, you know, and they'd been sent it in November. And I was on the committee advising them, and I said, and she said, if anybody's got any ideas, and I said, well, I've I've actually got an idea for a research project. We could change it into a professional development thing, if you like. And she said, great, and immediately gave me about 150,000 quid. <laughs> <laughs> and we managed to run a two-year project on that. And one of, the out one of the many outcomes of that project was I managed to demonstrate to the, to, in a convincing way to the rest of the academic community who were working on this, that three-year-olds were being metacognitive and the, in these four areas you could see evidence of them doing all sorts of self-regulatory, you know, the emerge, emerging ability to deliberately do something, to be aware of their own mental processes and to take charge of their mental activity and deliberately do things rather than being reactive all the time. And uh, this particular instrument, uh, I think, is one of my main achievements because it's been uh, used in Turkey, Germany, Israel, Bangladesh, Tanzania, Chile, and China, to my knowledge. And all those cases have been, it's been translated into different languages. And not once has anybody said, my teachers don't understand this. It really seems to have picked up on something that is universally true about young children between the ages of, of three and five. And we then did a chat project, which I did with Neil Mercer and Christine Howe, uh, who have very contributed to our made a huge contribution to our understanding about collaborative group work and about dialogic teaching and so on and so forth. And we did a project, one of my favorite um, acronyms, which I think Penny Coltman thought of, which was Children Articulating Thinking, or CHAT. <laughs> uh, and the, the value of getting children chatting was so powerfully demonstrated in this project. We had an intervention group and a comparison group, the intervention children were engaged in all sorts of collaborative group work and they were taught using Neil's um, system how to use what he calls exploratory talk at a high level to genuinely engage in discussion about problems we set them. And uh, we compared them to a match comparison group. And this was year one children. And rather sadly, the year one children in the comparison group, the blue line, actually decreased in their ability to show self-regulatory um, uh, capabilities during the course of their first year in school, and the um, intervention children massively increased. So they were learning to be more aware of and more uh, of their mental processing and more able to uh, to uh, deliberately engage in more effective strategies uh, just through this very simple mechanism. And we got huge effect sizes of 0.8, which are just not unheard of in educational research. And finally, we have my theory of play. Have I got one minute to do this? OK. So here are some things we know about play. But despite we know all of those things, what we don't know is what is it. And it turns out to all revolve, I hope I get this right. Oh, well, sorry. And this is more evidence about play. This is the plans project. Many of you will have seen the video on the Pedal website funded by the Lego Foundation, getting children engaging in building things in Lego that they were then going to subsequently write about. And was massively uh, interesting. Most, the most playful 
groups produce the most exploratory talk and the most closely shared regulation, both of which are very thing. And this is a lovely experiment I didn't do, where if you get children to pretend to be Batman, their ability to, to control their attention increases. Isn't that amazing? In play, children can do things they can't do when they're not playing. So they ask them to do it, do an attention task, being themselves, pretending to do it when they were their mum or dad, the third person, and pretending to do it when they were Batman. Batman has superpowers, and they can do it better. Amazing. Anyway, here, here we go on with my theory. So we've got the pedal center now set up, and these are the big questions we're trying to answer. And one of the big questions is, what is it? Uh, and I'm going to demonstrate to you what it is. It all revolves, it turns out, around the number 54. So if you take the word play and you convert the letters into numbers by saying, what, where are they in the alphabet? So for play, it would be 16 plus 12 plus 1 plus 25. That's the position of these letters in the alphabet. And that comes to 54. There are other ways of making 54, of course. You can make 54 like this. OK, now then. No, don't, don't, don't touch it. Now, <laughs> special price for anybody who can work out, so what does it equal? Convert those numbers back into letters, and what do you get? Hands up. Love, you do. Amazing, isn't it? You get, da -da, love, ta-da. <laughs> so the, there we are, cracked it. Play equals love, <laughs> which is quite a happy finding, I think. Um, not only is it mathematically true, but I think it's actually true because like love is something that we all know when we're feeling it. We all know when we're being playful. Uh, we enjoy being playful, we enjoy being in love, but can we define it? We can write poems about it, we can write novels about love, we can <laughs> you know, endlessly discuss it. Uh, and the reason is that play is a subjective experience. You are playing when you think you're playing. End of. Great, sorted. <laughs> okay. Thank you for listening. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, David. That's well, my pleasure. That beard is just amazing. And the flares, I think. <laughs> <laughs> for funding PEDAL, our amazing research centre, but also for establishing uh, the Lego chair, uh, which is now properly filled by Professor Paul Ramchandani, who starts, I believe, on the 1st of January or something like that, but who's actually been doing huge amounts with PEDAL already. So we're delighted to welcome John, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's my absolute pleasure to, uh, to be with you all today uh, on behalf of the Lego Foundation. Uh, our journey uh, with David started seven years ago with the message, five a day. Uh, can you guess what we were referring to at that point? Yes. Not apples and carrots, but the five types of play uh, that we were working with David on. Physical play, play with objects, symbolic play, pretend play, and uh, games with rules. And uh, over the years, David's clearly shown and shared the benefits of play to us uh, and to the public. Uh, and in fact, he has opened the eyes and minds uh, to entirely new words like private speech and self-regulation and metacognitive awareness. Uh, not just to fellow researchers, but at some stages, self-regulation is now frequently used in the Lego Foundation offices. You've, uh, you've developed and contributed to some of the most important reports and articles in children's development, play, and learning. Uh, but your legacy is not only manifested in reports uh, and words, but in the very fabric of uh, the LEGO Foundation's work. Uh, you've inspired uh, the work with children's play across several parliaments and governments, 
and truly inspired teachers to uh, integrate play into central aspects of literacy and uh, language learning. Uh, you've worked across South Africa, China, uh, Las Vegas, and more recently in Bangladesh with Brack and the Play Consortium. So the truth be told, David, we dragged you across the globe. Uh, we didn't actually send you to Las Vegas, but David had asked me to insert that one, something about expenses, reclaims, uh, I'm not quite sure what it was about. Uh, in your retirement, I don't think you'll be traveling any less, though, uh, because the powerful potential of, of play for children's learning and development is such a strong part of who you are that we believe that you're not going to be able to resist keeping going. And so for future partners and people that are working with David and will be traveling with him, we've got three important priorities uh, for all of you. The first one is to bring a backup stash of Yorkshire tea. The second priority is to bring more Yorkshire tea. And the third one is never run out of Yorkshire tea. <laughs> so just to help you get, ex uh, get started in whatever adventure that you go on next, we have something for you here, David. We've got you a Lego trolley bag that is full to the brim with Yorkshire tea. <laughs> and as a resident of York and a personal neighbor to the CEO of uh, Taylor's, the people that make Yorkshire tea, I can wholeheartedly attest that it's an essential traveling accompaniment. It was a wise choice admitting that one, David. <laughs> <coughs> so, uh, as many as you know, uh, and David's referenced, uh, he's not the only well-known uh, Cambridge researcher, not even the only Cambridge researcher with a white beard. Uh, he stands together with many prominent figures, uh, including Darwin. And I'm sure you would have noticed from the, uh, from the presentation already and from the invitation that there's more than a passing resemblance between uh, Darwin and, uh, and David. I'm not quite sure whether this is David doing Darwin or Darwin doing David. <laughs> now, Darwin was a pioneer in the field, recognized worldwide for his work and science of evolution, uh, but he also faced a lot of skepticism, albeit of a different kind in a different age. But David, you have battled the just play skepticism for years. You know, children's learning through play is not widely recognized, uh, especially not in education. Uh, and not as children grow older. And you've put science and play side by side in the plan study and now in the pedal center. Uh, as such, we wish to recognize you as a true pioneer of play. So with the help from the your PhD students and uh, from adult fans of Lego and from, not least, from Hannah Jensen in particular, we're proud to present uh, you, David, with a picture of, uh, of the pioneer at play. So, David, with the Pedal Center, your work is certainly going to uh, continue, and we're honored uh, to be part of this journey with you. So thank you very much for all of your contributions from the LEGO Foundation. This is our attempt to construct a Schutzian homunculus of you, David. David, to understand David, you have to understand he's a driven man. He's driven by a desire to overcome 
injustice through education. He was a product, like me, of the grammar school system. And though he passed his 11 plus exam, isn't it amazing how that's now come back around again? They always, things always come back again. His commitment to a high quality education for everybody was forged when his best friend didn't pass that exam. He thought it was, of course it is, grossly unfair that his equally capable friend couldn't access the same education as he was accessing on the basis of a few marks on an examination. He's been campaigning ever since. And this theme of fair access to high quality education has been the touchstone of his career. As well as the belief that childhood, as we've seen, is a unique time of creativity, curiosity, and that school should serve the child's needs, not the other way around, which actually is becoming increasingly common if you think about the discourse about school. So as we've seen in his sort of extraordinary autobiography on the screen, after teaching for 12 years, David went on to become a developmental psychologist and an international expert in early childhood education. He's worked in higher education in Cambridge for over 30 years. During his first 17 years at Cambridge, he worked in early years initial teacher training, first at Homerton College and then at the Faculty of Education in the PGC. During that time, I have read your personnel file with great interest. During that time, it's quite clear that David is somebody who rolled up his sleeves and got stuck in. He coordinated the advanced diploma in education studies for the Suffolk Local Education Authority, the advanced diploma in early years education, and the primary PGC of Homerton College. He also survived what we all know to be the toughest job. <laughs> David moved from Homerton College to become a member of the new Faculty of Education in 2001. And that offered a wealth of new opportunities. For example, over the last 15 years, he's supervised around 30 PhD students from all corners of the world. We saw on the screen of the rock. And he's remembered by the colleagues who co supervised him with him as a PhD supervisor who put himself out for his students as positive, encouraging, but tough insisting rightly on the highest standards. David, you were clearly an active researcher and writer before you joined the faculty, but you then seemed to hit the accelerator. You have developed an international reputation for your work on metacognition and self-regulated learning in young children, and the vital importance of high quality, playful early years education. You've been an active member of the European Association for Research on Learning and Instruction, a key member of the psychology and education group within the faculty. David has published widely in academic journals and book chapters and has edited or written a number of reports and books, including Quality and Early Childhood Education, an international review and guide for policymakers. I hear that's on Michael Doe's main reading. <laughs> Teaching and Learning in the Early Years, Developmental Psychology and Early Childhood Education. And the importance of play and a report on the value of children's play in a series of policy recommendations. David, as we all know, is much loved by students and colleagues alike. He is warm, witty, and wise, and his characteristic Yorkshire informality and lack of pretension means that he makes friends wherever he goes. You are an extremely inspirational, David, for colleagues and students alike. You've also, I've discovered, carried the flag for education within the university in many ways, not least through your golf. <laughs> With David Whiteley, who won the Interfaculty's Golf Cup several times, fending off fierce opposition, particularly from engineering. He's a member of the Green Party, an adoring husband and father, and is also a Linda, if you can go to Judge White, is determined that she votes by now. Standing relationship, working in partnership, developing the initial ideas behind the 
invited the poor Afghan army to take them. We of course immensely grateful to Lego for their valuable support and we owe Lego their gratitude for this key role in this project. For those that are toddler and three years old, Pebble is already making its mark internationally, and David is continuing to be in constant demand as a speaker, writer, and expert. You'll always be welcome. As Jeff has said, um, David leaves a wonderful legacy in the form of Pebble. But as every teacher in the room and every academic in the room knows, that there's really no greater legacy than your students. And as a treat tonight, we're going to end with are three of David's PhD students who are going to give us some insights. I don't know into their research, or David, or both. Uh, we have Kate Noble, we have Maria Ericacius, and we have Martina Kubelaja. I hope I got that, got that right. Well, I'm very fortunate to have been a student of David's for, well, the last 20 years, actually, because I started off, I see David's gone, I started off um, as a B.Ed. student on the early years course here um, a long time ago. Uh, so I thought, rather than talking about my research, I'd talk more generally about the way in which David has inspired my practice as an educator and as a researcher um, over the last 20 years. Um, I currently work at the Fitzwilly Museum as a museum and gallery educator, so um, pictures are my business. So <laughs> I'm going to use pictures mainly to describe what I want to talk about. Um, my own PhD was in the development of visual literacy with young children. Um, David was my co-supervisor with Morag Styles, And I went from, I finished that 10 years ago and went on to work at the Fitzwilly Museum, primarily on the schools program, um, but also then worked developing the families program as well. But I thought this was a good slide to start with because it has a child in capture. And that face, is, that's just the joy of learning, isn't it, that David's been talking about. Um, which bit there? Okay. Oh, and this is... <laughs> More very happy um, faces uh, in, I also work as, a, as well as a practitioner, I work as an education researcher at the National Gallery as well, where it's interesting, I, was just, I, I met with um, Polly, who was one of, another one of my teachers when I started at Homerton, and um, I was thinking actually, talking about early years and, and the status of early years education, something that's happened since I did my PhD was early years education has been recognised, but the importance of early years in informal settings like museums and galleries has really um, taken off as well. Can't hear me, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, so I was just saying that um, we've really begun to celebrate um, and find a role for young children in informal settings as well. Um, and that's one of the things that I've worked very hard on in the last 10 years in the places that I work. So starting with the schools, starting, um, I wanted to start with my practice as a schools, as a, uh, an early years teacher with my school. And David talked earlier about his book, Teaching and Learning in the Early Years, which I'd actually, when I was preparing for this, I thought that was really a really um, important part of my training, the things that, um, experiences I had here, with this amazing team of lecturers here, but also this book was my Bible when I started teaching. I know many of my uh, fellow students bought it as well, and it was something I always referred back to um, in my early years as a teacher um, to guide my thinking and to remind me what was important what mattered in terms of children and their learning and, and how to meet those needs and this sense of fun and wonder and excitement. Okay. And now um, I hope that uh, to build on this with the work that we do, um, that I continue to do with the Faculty of Education, I think I saw Jane earlier with Jane Warwick here as well, working with trainee teachers here, um, uh, but take, working in the Fitzwilliam Museum, um, here we are experimenting with a playful approach to learning via sketching and drawing and making art. And I think there's lots of parallels between creative pedagogies in um, making art and art practice as well as um, very much in common with that sort of creativity and, and learning as well. But then I was also thinking about David's... I think David's great talent is to teach child development in a way that was really embedded in practice. And it's really funny the sto watching the, the, the enactment of the ketchup bottle and the milk story. Um, 
that I, I often, when I'm thinking, and I'm, I'm thinking about young children, how they learn, those stories are, 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 so, are so evocative and so, and so, so vital in terms of um, bringing things to life. And those, those little stories about everyday situations where these theories are brought to life are so, are so, so, so important in terms of memories. More playful learning again, this time building, constructing, learning about buildings. I thought you'd like this one. <laughs> Messy feet, experimenting, testing, playing with materials. First hand experience, vital, which is a challenge in a museum gallery. But um, this, what David was saying earlier about this, the serious nature of young children and the needs of young children and to respect young children as learners and spend the time to observe and to watch and to learn from children and this is uh, some photos of a more, one of the more recent research projects that I've been working on with some other practitioners at the Fitzwilliam and also at the University of Botanic Gardens where we were very fortunate to be able to um, have a group of young children in residence in the museum and in the garden for a week and we spent time just watching them which was a real treat is a little girl engaged in serious business of making and sensory experience, experiencing the world around them. And the role of the practitioner, the research informed practitioner, again, this, again through the, the, the book and through when I think about that legacy of David's work over the years and how it's informed my practice. Some more playing, playing with children. I, I thought I'd finished with this slide, which was the, I thought it was quite a nice metaphor with the revolving doors, a metaphor for this idea of this journey, this sort of iterative process of research informed practice, which I think is so key to, to David's work. Continually reviewing, reflecting, and developing. And again, I, I sort of thought it was a nice metaphor for the many doors that you've opened over the years, for the many thousands of practitioners, researchers, and children who have worked with you and been inspired by your work, either directly or indirectly, over the, over the many years of your research and teaching as well. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for all, all your inspiration and hope that you and your family will come and visit us at the Fitzwilliam Museum. As you, I, I flick through the child, the, the, the picture with the grandparent doing the workshop, but we do run pre workshops for grandparents and their grandchildren as well, so we hope very much to see you there soon. Thanks a lot, David. My name is Maria, and I came all the way from Cyprus just for David. And um, to be honest, I was surprised that when people asked me around, uh, they were surprised because I came. For me, it's not a surprise. As soon as I got the invitation, it wasn't a dilemma at all. Uh, even when uh, my child's play, uh, Christmas play was going to be tomorrow, I changed my flights in order to be there so I could be in both places. Um, I'm a former PhD of David's and I'm honored to be he here uh, and say a few words. You have to excuse me, English is not my first language. And I'm also getting a little bit emotional besides my PhD research was children's play and emotions. Therefore, there you go. <laughs> uh, since uh, my strongest identity, apart from being a mom, is that of a teacher, uh, an early years teacher. I will talk about David in an allegorical, allegorical way through a story. My story is looking for Santa, or um, the Santa, the girl, and the wise man. Once upon a time, there was a little girl. That girl had a t dream. Her dream was to meet Santa. One day she went for a walk and she met a very wise man. The wise man had white hair, smiling eyes, and a beard. He looked very kind and helpful. Hello, said the wise man. Hello, the girl replied. You look sad, said the wise man. Yes, said the girl. I'm sad because I want to find and meet Santa. 
The wise man then explained to the girl that in order to meet Santa, she needed to make a long and difficult journey. The journey will be difficult, but do not worry, said the wise man. I will make this journey with you. The girl started to walk. She walked for days and months. She walked many miles. I'm tired, said the girl to the wise man. I understand, said the wise man. Hold my hand and I will help you. Just imagine the day that you will meet Santa. He's kind and understanding. He has a special gift for you. He understands people very deeply and he accepts you no matter what, said the wise man. The girl kept walking and she stopped again. I'm tired, Santa, said the girl. It's difficult. I want to go back home. I miss my family. You have to walk many more miles, but you can make it. I believe in you. I'm here for you, said the wise man. I will carry you if it's necessary. After years of walking, the girl saw two small rabbits laying on the grass next to the road. The girl approached the rabbits and started to play with them. The wise man was standing behind the girl. I want to stay and play a little bit with the rabbits, said the girl. Her voice sounded worried. She knew that staying with the rabbits would delay their journey. She was afraid that the wise man would want to leave her by her own. Do not worry, said the wise man. I will wait for you. Besides, staying with the rabbits will have you understand more deeply the importance of play. And the wise man waited patiently until the girl was ready to continue the journey. The girl found three big rabbits and she said to the small rabbits, you can play with them for a while and I'll come back for you. After years of walking, the girl and the wise man approached a shining room and the wise man said to the girl, we arrived. This is the room. I cannot enter though. You will have to walk in by yourself. I will be here waiting for you. The girl entered the room and she saw a man inside. The man looked kind and smiled at her. Hello, Santa, said the girl. I wanted to meet you. Everybody told me about you, said the girl. Then the girl noticed something very strange. The face of Santa looked very familiar. You look familiar, said to the Santa. The girl then figured it out. The wise man was Santa. Then the wise man whispered to a girl a special phrase. How you teach something is far more important than what you teach. The journey of my PhD was difficult but rewarding. The decision to, trigger, to pursue a PhD at Cambridge triggered my wish to meet distinguished and important scholars. God blessed me to meet my supervisor, Dr. David Whitebread. David. David combines academic and personal excellence, and he told me with his own living example that how you teach something is far more important than you teach, than what you teach. I'm deeply grateful to him for believing in me and my project, as well for supporting me all through the way of my PhD. Said, thank you, David, for helping me understand the meaning of my journey. Thank you for helping me find my own Ithaca. Thank you, wise man. Thank you, Santa. Some of you might think that I have talked evenly today about David and my family. Because if you see here the casting, of course the wise man and the Santa was David, myself and my family. You can see a picture of them all. So I talk evenly today about David and my family, which means a lot to me. This is because it does make sense for me. It, it is, if it wasn't for David, I wouldn't have to choose finishing my PhD or being a mom. Thank you, David, for not making me make this choice. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Martina, and I am I'm here today uh, because uh, David was my supervisor for my master's and my PhD um, uh, topic, uh, project studies. I've known David since 2008, so that will be 10 years now, which is, which is a lot, I think. And um, 
This is my thank you for all your guidance and for huge, enormous support um, you've um, you provided during this time. Um, so this is, um, actually I found that email uh, from 2009, uh, and this is when David actually formally agreed that he's going to supervise me for my master's project. Um, so I thought that was very cute, and I'm just wondering how many times did you regret making this decision? Uh, but, um, yeah. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about um, the project, my PhD project, uh, that David and I work together. Um, so this is me um, uh, collecting the data for my PhD. Um, I am explaining instructions to children um, uh, on how to complete the planning task. And the planning task is the next click. And uh, this is an actual photo of, of for, for, this is a photo from my actual project. Uh, this is part of the planning task. So you can see that it looks really creative and colorful and really lovely, right? So the next one, and this is me today. This is where I am today. And you see, I joined assessment industry, and I think I'm, as such, I think I'm one of the biggest failures of, of David. Uh, <laughs> so I, in David's words, I joined the dark side. So here's me on the dark side, um, tempting other PhD students to join. No, I'm not, I'm not. It's, it's really tragic, really, but yeah, there, there I am. Um, so going back to the PhD, um, now the picture, yeah. So going back to the PhD, it wasn't all colorful, and it, was, it wasn't all um, uh, creative and fun. Uh, there were really difficult times uh, where I literally thought I'm never going to finish. And thank you, David, for being there all the time when I needed you the most. Um, the next one, please. And you can, you can see, um, it said, this is the card I bought while I was writing up. And this is, again, actual um, situation, real life situation. Um, and it did pass, probably too quickly, because this is, I know it passed, because this is uh, David and me and my mom um, uh, on the day when I graduated. So thank you for that, David. Um, I never left your office um, upset or unhappy, uh, unlike that observation lab, which I left many times in fury. Uh, but, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, next one. So, um, people say that we always remember only the positive things and the most uh, wonderful things, and I agree, because I have so many uh, wonderful memories of uh, eating wonderful food, uh, drinking nice wine, and dancing um, at each of the conferences, after each of the conferences we attended. I'm not gonna uh, show the video of you dancing uh, to that thriller of Michael Jackson. Um, <laughs> we had that, yeah. And so this was my first conference with David's group, and this was in Munster in 2010. And the next picture, that's just about to come, uh, was my last conference with David as a member of his group in 2014. This is in Istanbul on a boat, and this is where Michael Jackson happened, actually, um, on that boat. Um, I also did business with uh, David, and this is uh, basically David helping me to fund my fourth year PhD. Um, we are in Qatar here, um, but we did some good reports. I think we, we, we produced some good reports for uh, Qatar Foundation, Lego Foundation, and Toy Industries of Europe, and um, with other uh, of David's PhD students. And the next little picture is just our poster where I've been renamed to Dr. Martin. Uh, well, that's fine, I'm fine with that, but th this was <laughs> going back to the, to the early um, experiences as being the most important uh, for later achievement and success in, in life and um, professionally. There's a quote from that report we wrote. So if we could go um, on. Yeah. So talking more about the best supervisor, um, uh, this is David actually, um, so in, in 2015 Pablo nominated uh, one of other David's students nominated uh, David for um, the University Best Supervisor Award. And surprise, surprise, um, David won that award. And I, I just felt like this can't go unnoticed. Um, and this is us. Um, we were very privileged to be there uh, when David actually received his award. It was a lovely um, ceremony in the Senate House. Um, yeah. And more of the best supervisor. So for, for some of you, yeah, actually David um, uh, talked about that. So every year at the end of the academic year, David would 
organise um, end of the year party. And this was normally hosted either in the orchard uh, in Grantchester or in David and Linda's uh, home in their garden. So this is in 2010 and we are in David's garden, a small group. Then this is 2012 when we actually bought, uh, this um, event always happened in July and it always coincided with David's birthday, which is on the 9th, am I correct? So we bought him a mobile phone because he just didn't have a mobile phone when everyone else did. And we bought him a mobile phone for his birthday and I don't think he ever used it. And I actually don't think, oh you did. Twice, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so that was that. Uh, that was 2012, and the next one is 2014. I think the it, it's a huge group, and this is also uh, partners and childrens of uh, David's um, students and um, and uh, associates. And then this last one is this summer in his garden. So the the survival of the fittest. I think it's that that one. Um, so yeah, I, it, it overlaps with David, but I thought it, it, this would really be really interesting to show because as you, lost, a lot of you know, um, most of us, most of David's uh, PhD students um, came from far away from, they, they actually spent their, I would say, one of the most intense periods of their professional lives away from their family and home. And um, all those dinners and lunches and teas with David and his family were really important for us and they were as warm and um, as welcoming as those in our own families. And I would like to thank you for that because you were our family in Cambridge. Um, thank you. Next one, oh, no, not, not yet, not, don't clap. Uh, <laughs> yes, so once again, um, this is from a few years ago for, uh, from um, a David's Christmas party. Um, David, once again, I would like to thank you for uh, being a wonderful mentor, um, and I'm not thanking you only on my behalf, I'm thanking you for, on behalf of all of your uh, students, 30-something um, of them. Um, it was my great pleasure to learn from you and to work with you, and I wish you all the best for your future adventures, which I feel there will be plenty. Thank you very much. <laughs> fantastic array of things that David's done and it's lovely to hear all of you speak so passionately about uh, what he did for you in terms of your professional lives so that's fantastic so um, it's nearly time to have a drink which I'm sure you'll be happy to hear <laughs> is it time to have a drink almost well, we've got we've got a few videos and we just really want to put one of them on and then the other one can go in the background whilst we drink Excellent. Okay, so we will, like well, we'll, we will end proceedings now, but thank you all very much for coming. Um, it's been a fantastic evening, and hopefully David feels that he's been sent off in style with lots of pictures of Darwin and <coughs> things to remember us by. Um, and we'll end with... Hello David, sorry we can't be there, um, I'm in the US. And I'm on a plane, I think. He thinks. Yeah, I think <laughs> it might be about to arrive in Hong Kong. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. And thank you. And here's... Wish um, we could be there. Here's our song, yeah, in place of us being there. In C? In D, actually. In D, just in case Don't get you, you want to play along. If Matt gets the key wrong, it'll all fall apart. <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> so, okay, this is Goodbye David Whitebread. In the faculty of education is a man whose work has caused reverberations in play, creativity, self-regulation, and educational implementation. His name's David.
going well. Keep going, we can edit. He said, stop, hesitate, take a moment, self-regulate. And can you remind me, did we come to a decision about the existence of implicit metacognition? Did we? His name's David. Yeah, you're supposed to do that.